Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the ANOVA Biosciences webinar series. Today's webinar, Drug Screening Assays for Phosphate Generating Enzymes, will discuss methods of phosphate detection and focus on phosphate generating enzymes such as ATPases and GTPases. Our speaker today is Dr. Nick G. Nick is a biochemist with over 20 years experience in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry and is the CEO and CSO of Inova Biosciences. Earlier in his career, Nick worked in drug screening labs on the development of inhibitors to phosphate generating enzymes. He also has expertise in protein purification, assay development, and bioconjugation systems and is the inventor of the Lightning Link antibody conjugation system. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Please submit your questions by typing in the questions box in the control panel. The questions box is circled in red here. Please feel free to send in questions and we will answer as many as we can in the question and answer session. If we do not have enough time for all the questions, we will respond to the remaining ones by email. And that's the basics laid out. Now please welcome Nick. Hello everyone. Um, these are the areas we're going to cover today. Um, I'm actually going to go slightly out of sequence and uh, kick off with um, enzyme activity. So do you need to worry about enzyme units or even calculate units? Well, for drug screening work, probably not because it's the relative activity in the presence and absence of drug that is the main consideration. Um, if you're comparing enzyme activity in different samples, then the answer will be yes, you need to calculate uh, units. Um, when you're purchasing phosphate generating enzymes, it's not essential to know anything about units, but it can help you to make the best selection and get the best value if there's more than one supplier. Okay, the enzyme unit. This is defined as the amount of enzyme that converts one micromole of substrate into product in one minute. Um, so if you have X enzyme units in 10 microliters and X enzyme units in one mil, we have the same number of units, but we have different concentrations if we express it as units per mil. So, so that's fairly straightforward. Specific enzyme activity, this is, this is more connected with purity. So this is the number of enzyme units per mig of enzyme. So in the above, in the above example, <clears throat> The specific activity in each case is exactly the same. Um, essentially, we've divided units per mil by mig per mil to get units per mig. Um, so you can't dilute an enzyme and change the specific activity. You can change the concentration. Okay, hopefully you're still with me on this. This can cause a lot of confusion uh, calculating enzyme units. Um, so I've done this in a stepwise fashion rather than give you a formula. Um, essentially what you'll be doing is determining the amount of phosphate generated by reading off from a standard curve. This will give you the number of micromoles of product formed. Then your assay time was probably not one minute, so to convert to micromoles per min, i.e. enzyme units, you need to divide by the assay time. To get the number of units per mil of reaction mix, your assay was probably 50 microliters or 100 microliters. So you need to multiply by 1,000 divided by your assay volume to get units per mil of reaction mix. Then if you want to get units per mil of enzyme, the enzyme was only part of the total assay volume, so you multiply by the total volume divided by the volume of enzyme added. And then moving on to the last stage, if you, dilute, if you diluted your enzyme before you added it to your assay, then you need to multiply by the dilution factor. So if it was 1 in 100, you multiply by 100 to get units per mil of undiluted enzyme. So that, so that may seem fairly convoluted, but if, um, if you're having difficulty understanding the calculations, if you do it in a stepwise fashion like that, you can't go wrong. Um, however, we could express that as a formula. Um, what tends to happen when you do that is the numerator, the terms in the numerator and denominator often cancel out. So we have, for an example, uh, an ATPase assay kit. And the calculation distills down to just A times C divided by 500B. 
where A is the concentration that you read off your standard curve, B is the assay time in minutes, which you know, and C is the dilution factor of your enzyme. So in a matter of four or five seconds, you can just type those numbers into a calculator and get your answer. So it's really quite, straight, quite straightforward. Anyway, I'm not going to say any more about enzyme units in the rest of this presentation, but we do get a lot of questions on that, so I hope that was helpful. Okay, let's move, let's move on to phosphate. There, there's a lot of atoms in, a, in, in phosphate, so for simplicity, we're going to abbreviate phosphate, inorganic phosphate to PI, and uh, organic phosphate, i.e. phosphate attached to a carbon containing substrate, just the substrate P. So turning to assays of phosphate generating enzymes, essentially an enzyme acts on a substrate which has a phosphate to create a dephosphorylated product which is specific to this substrate. So the structure of this product will closely resemble this substrate. We also have a universal product. PI, which will be formed regardless of what this substrate is. There may be a hundred different, well, there's probably thousands of substrates, but they will all generate PI, but they will each have a specific dephosphorylated product here. So there are three approaches to uh, performing an assay. You could measure the disappearance of the substrate. This is not really a good method because in a typical assay, only 10% of the substrate is converted into product. You could measure the appearance of the specific product. This, this is a perfectly fine approach, but any method that you develop to measure this will be very much applicable to this substrate and not to other substrates. The third approach is to measure the appearance of the universal product, PI. Now this is ideal because if you have a system for measuring this, you can plug in any number of different enzyme reactions and measure a common product. Okay, this, this just shows some of the, the next three slides show some of the assay types that one could use to measure phosphate generating enzymes. So first type here, radioactive, P32 labeled substrate, obviously producing P32 inorganic phosphate. This is quite commonly done, particularly with protein substrates. Um, it's not, um, not a fantastic assay for high throughput screening, of course, because of the, the radioactivity. Uh, in some cases, the radioactivity can be on the carbon backbone, in which case you generate a 14C specific product. Um, so the pros of the, these assays are high sensitivity, and there's no interference from endogenous PI because that's not radioactive. The cons are obviously radioactivity. And you will always need a separation step to separate the product from the remaining substrate, or in this case, the C14 product from the C14 substrate. Next assay type is a colorimetric endpoint assay. This is the phosphate generated from an enzyme reaction. After a period of incubation, say 15 minutes, the phosphate is accumulated. You then add a dye stop reagent. This stops the reaction and initiates color development, and then you read your assay. So a typical example would be a malachite green assay. And uh, we'll speak much more about this in the rest of the presentation. Pros are that it's simple and non-radioactive. Cons, you can get interference from phosphate in your samples. Malachite reagents are also very acidic, so there's a risk of non-enzymatic hydrolysis of phosphorylated su substrates, which will give you high backgrounds in your assay. Most of those problems have now been solved, and I'll say more of that in the rest of the presentation. Okay, the third assay type that you might come across are the coupled assays. Again, phosphate is generated from a reaction. It's then reacted with another molecule. This is just one example, inosin, which is converted by nucleoside phosphorylase. Uh, converts to uh, hypoxanthine, 
which in turn is converted into uric acid. Uh, concomitantly, tetrazolium salt is converted into formazan, which is red. Um, pros of this assay is that it's continuous. You could put all of these components in a single cuvette in a spectrophotometer, and if you were hooked up to a chart recorder, you could see the development of the color in real time. There are also no acidic reagents. Um, cons of this approach is that you have a very complex three enzyme system. So it's not suitable for identification of in inhibitors in high throughput screening because there are three potential targets there. Right, turning back to this malachite, malachite green assay format. There are two distinct steps. Uh, phosphorylated substrate is converted into uh, X, in this case, plus inorganic phosphate. Then in the second stage, we stop the reaction with a dye, uh, which contains acid, which leads to the formation of a PI dye complex, which is green. Now, this is a very nice assay for high throughput screening. Um, despite its simplicity, there are things to watch out for. For example, you could have PI contamination in your substrate or in your enzyme. Or as I mentioned before, you could get non-enzymatic decay. So you get phosphate that's completely independent of the enzyme. And with malachite reagents, quite often you can get precipitation. So what I'm going to do now is just go on to how you would set up this type of assay and also address the various problems and how you might overcome those. Okay, the first question to ask is do you have a pure enzyme or a crude extract? Now if you have a pure enzyme, the product that's formed must be attributed to this enzyme because there are no others in the system. So this is a very, very simple setup, perhaps the most commonly used one in high throughput screening labs um, because there's no confusion about where the product has been, uh, where the product has come from. Um, very often you might have a crude preparation of enzyme. It could contain multiple phosphatases. In this situation, your substrate needs to be very specific for a particular enzyme, let's say enzyme number two. If it is, the phosphate that's generated can be attributed to that enzyme and to no, and to no others. So just to reiterate that, if you've got a crude extract, your substrate must be hydrolyzed only by the enzyme of interest. Alternatively, if you do have a crude extract, and this is very commonly done, you can pull out the enzyme from the crude sample using an antibody uh, before you carry out the enzyme assay. Okay, second step is to prepare the standard curve, which involves measuring the absorbance in your assay with known amounts of inorganic phosphate. And ideally the standard curve should be linear. Uh, with malachite, uh, malachite assays it, it nearly always is. Uh, this is very simple to do. There's no enzyme at this stage, no substrate. So this should be uh, relatively easy to do. Step three is to find the linear range for the assay. Um, you need to choose a reaction time that's convenient. 15 minutes is typical, but it could be up to 60 minutes. You add your enzyme substrate and measure the amount of product formed. So this is typically what you would get uh, if you did a time course. You would have a linear region and then it deviates out here. So when you're measuring samples, all the readings must fall within this linear range. So for example, if you stop your assay at this point, you would measure this signal, but in reality you should have measured something a little bit higher. So it's important to work in the linear range. And um, if you would like a longer assay time, so you go out like this, just dilute your enzyme a little bit more. So you, there's a lot of flexibility. You just have to pick something that suits you and then determine the linear range. 
Okay, these are some of the problems you can face with malachite reagents. Um, precipitation within 30 to 60 minutes is quite common. So, um, in other biosciences, has a modified malachite reagent which shows much much greater stability. Um, and here we show standard curves with various reagents and you can see that some are linear and some start to deviate at relatively low phosphate concentrations. Um, PI Colorlock Gold and ALS uh, are two of our products. We now just sell the gold reagent because everyone likes the, the higher sensitivity. But uh, whatever reagent you use, you really need to see a standard curve that looks pretty linear. Okay, this just illustrates the stability of the PI color lock malachite dye PI complex. Um, this is obviously perfect for drug screening labs where you might have hundreds of plates. Um, you can just read them at your leisure because you're not going to uh, lose the signal because you've got aggregation in the wells. Um, also, if you just have a couple of plates, if someone's on the machine before you, you, you don't need to worry. You can just read when the machine's available. Okay, this is just uh, an example of the data you would get using uh, malachite reagents in a drug screening uh, setup. Uh, this is an acetyl monophosphatase enzyme known in hibiscus lithium. And we get an IC50, typical dose response curve, IC50 uh, as expected. Okay. Um, this shows some of the interferences that you can get in PI color lock malachite assays. As you can see, commonly used buffers and substances um, have no negative effect in the assay. Um, just highlight one or two uh, things from this table. Most uh, phosphate generating enzymes require a metal ion. Metal ions have no effect with this, uh, with this system. Um, BSA would quite often be found in um, enzyme assays. You, know, you just need to make sure you don't have too much in there. Uh, 0.1 mg per mil is fine. 1 mg per mil is getting a little bit high. Um, DMSO is fine. Obviously, this is very important in drug screening because uh, this is pretty much a universal solvent. Um, if your assay needs detergents, we have seen with concentrations between 0 and 0.03% uh, aggregation in some situations. Uh, the simple solution if you need detergent is just to make sure you're above 0.03% and everything will be fine. Right, um, non-enzymatic hydrolysis, which I mentioned earlier, this is a major problem and uh, I can also present the cure for that problem. So here's the the reaction again, phosphorylated substrate acted on by the enzyme turned into product. However, as I said, only 10% of the substrate typically should be hydrolyzed in an enzyme reaction. So 90% is still phosphorylated substrate. And many phosphorylated substrates are sensitive to acid. So ATP, GTP, malachite reagents are very acidic. So you can get hydrolysis and high backgrounds. So the PI color lock reagent that we have has a special background suppression system. So even if you incubate uh, an acid sensitive substrate in the reagent, there's no enzyme here. You get essentially a flat baseline, but without the suppression systems, you get increasingly high background as the color develops. This has nothing to do with enzyme action. Another thing to watch out for, you may have PI in your system before you even start your assay. The substrate, especially if you've got ATP or GTP, may be contaminated with PI, so you need high quality reagents. Um, fairly obvious statement here I think, but don't use phosphate assay buffer. Um, obviously you're going to get a severely uh, a severe aggregation if you do that. Um, 
Tissue cell extracts, it's also worth remembering, they have a lot of inorganic phosphate derived from the cells. So you need to desalt or dialyze your samples. Or you can use something called pibine resin, resin which is a phosphate scavenging resin. Uh, I can show you that here, where we've spiked a range of buffers with one millimolar phosphate and then added pibine beads. Uh, this is the control, no resin, and you can see under a wide range of conditions we can suck contaminating phosphate out of buffers or out of samples. Okay, these are some of the applications of the malachite assay that I've described. You can measure ATPases, pyrophosphatases, GTPases, phosphatases. ATPases that produce pyrophosphate you can run these assays with excess pyrophosphatase in the assay. So any product is converted into inorganic phosphate, which you can measure with the malachite reagent. Uh, sugar phosphatases. I mean, the, the list is endless. So the general case here, uh, XPN converted into XPN minus 1 and measure inorganic phosphate. These are examples from the literature that use modified malachite reagents. Um, these are just some that I've lifted from the literature. So people are measuring nuclease, stroke helicases, heat shock proteins, P-type ATPases, DNA stimulated ATPases, GTPases, nuclear GTPases, um, transferases. I uh, found this example uh, with UTP being converted into pyrophosphate and, and in this particular paper excess pyrophosphatase was used to uh, essentially produce the universal um, product which can be picked up by the malachite reagent, um, sodium potassium ATPase. So um, by focusing on a universal product of phosphate generating enzymes you can assay a very, very large range of enzymes and you've just done the assay development once. Okay, just a final reminder of things to think about if you're, if you're going to use malachite reagents. These are the questions that you should ask. Is my enzyme pure or crude? Does my enzyme contain any free phosphate? Is it contaminated? Is the substrate contaminated with free phosphate? Um, how quickly are you going to read your assay plates? Is your substrate sensitive to acid? Uh, as I said, ATP, GTP are particularly sensitive. And is your substrate hydrolyzed by more than one enzyme? This is important if you have a crude sample. So if you think about these things, it's fairly easy to get the best setup for your assay. Uh, easy to determine whether you need a standard or modified malachite reagent and, and whether any sample cleanup is required. Okay, finally, just a summary of Innova products and help that we can provide. So we have this modified malachite reagent, PI Color Lock Gold, with its background suppression system. Uh, liter quantities are available for high throughput screening applications. We have ATPAs and GTPAs assay kits with ultra pure substrate, again for low backgrounds. Um, we have pie bind resin, which is great for cleaning up enzyme samples or buffers. And if you struggled with the enzyme unit uh, discussion at the beginning of the presentation, we also have a guide to enzyme units, which is free on our website. And thanks for your attention today. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, let's move on to our question and answer session now. Thank you for sending in your questions. Please bear in mind that you can still send in questions by uh, typing them into this questions box here. And Nick will answer as many as possible in the time allocated. And if there are any remaining questions after that time is up, then we will get back to you by email. And we do also welcome any other feedback that you may have. Um, 
We also have an extensive collection of re references um, in which researchers have used our phosphate detection kits in the past. And if you're wondering about using PI Color Lock ATPAs or GTPAs kits in a particular application, uh, please feel free to browse these references on our website, which are found under the References tab here on our website pointed out by the arrow. And if you would like any more information, uh, you can always contact us at info at innovabiosciences.com. Please bear in mind that this webinar is recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days so that you can always come back to it. You can find our channel at youtube.com forward slash innovabiosciences. Please keep an eye out on our social media channels where we will soon be advertising our upcoming webinars. And if you would like to receive a PDF copy of the presentation or a link to the video recording of the webinar, please contact me. You can find my contact details on any of the webinar emails you've received. All right, well that's all the background information and now let's move on to some questions. So the first question is, how much substrate should I have in my assay? Okay. Um... The ideal situation is that you're going to hydrolyze 5%, uh, 5 to 10 percent of your substrate. Um, so to get a good signal, you're probably going to need somewhere between uh, 0.25 and 1 millimolar substrate. Uh, that will generate enough phosphate to get uh, a reasonable signal in your assay. Okay, the next question is, do you need to read malachite assays at a specific wavelength? Oh, um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. The, the best wavelength is uh, 650 nanometers, but um, anywhere from 590 up to about 650 is fine. So if you don't have a 650 uh, filter, you've quite a broad range there. Uh, the main thing is when you've, when you've selected a wavelength is just to stick with it. Um, so that you can compare results from different experiments. Okay, um, the next question is, should you plot micromole of PI or concentration of PI on the x-axis of the standard curve? Okay, this is a good question. This relates back to enzyme units and uh, some of the confusion that you can have with calculations. Um, it actually doesn't matter which way you do it. Um, if you plot micromole, then it's very simple to move from that to the activity calculation because that is the starting position. You need to know the number of micromoles. Um, however, if you're like me, you tend to think, I think, in terms of concentration. So I would actually plot concentration on the, the x-axis. Um, the only thing to remember is that you need to uh, move from that number, which is a concentration, to the absolute amount before you do the calculation. So you just factor it into the, the formula. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's up to you really, you can do either. Just remember to convert if necessary before you calculate units. Okay, the next question is, what does none at detergents mean? Okay, um, this obviously this is from the table. Um, let me just look at a paper copy in case, in case that wasn't clear. All right, yeah, none is just no, no effect. Um, so the, the substance is in the table, but those concentrations, there's no, there's no effect on the assay, so you'll just get um, uh, the expected signal, no, no inhibition or any aggregation, anything like that. Okay, the next question is, what are standard assay conditions? Okay, this, this stems from a very early slide. Um, it's actually quite difficult to answer this question because I mean, I, it typically it's 25 degrees C. Um, there's also uh, an implicit understanding, I think, that the buffer is, has been optimized, the pH is optimal. Um, it's quite rare that people run assays strictly under standard conditions. Um, so you don't really need to worry about that. The main thing is that 
pick a temperature, pick a buffer, um, pick a pH, do whatever optimization, optimization uh, that you require, and then stick with it. So they become your standard conditions. If you're comparing activity of your enzyme with someone else's enzyme, then you need to just check that their conditions are similar. They probably won't be identical, but if there are any significant differences, then that might explain why you have different results. Okay, the next question is, can I use PyBind to clean up phosphorylated substrates? Yeah, we, we have this question quite a lot. Um, I wish the answer were yes, um, but the PyBind resin has a very, very high affinity for phosphate. It also has a reasonable affinity for things like ATP. So we can't recommend really that you would clean up uh, phosphorylated substrates with pybine resin um, really need good quality substrate. Right, so the next question is, can we use this system to test DNA polymerases which generate pyrophosphate? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to give a 100% guarantee on, on an enzyme we haven't tested ourselves, but um, one of the examples from the literature that I that I mentioned um, was a transferase enzyme which which generated pyrophosphate from UTP. So um, there's no reason why why this wouldn't work. You just rec you just need to do a little bit of optimization on the amount of pyrophosphatase because it's quite important that any PPI that's generated by your enzyme is quickly converted into inorganic phosphate. Um, but clearly that's just a question of basic optimization experiments. Um, remember too, if you need to calculate activity, that you get two inorganic phosphates for each uh, pyrophosphate. So the activity will look uh, uh, twice as high as it really is. The next question is, what is the assay sensitivity in 96 or 384 well format? Well, well, that's a great question, actually. I, I, I should have said something in the, about this in the presentation. One of the, one of the great things about colorimetric assays is that um, the sensitivity does not drop when you miniaturize. Now, that's, there are very few assays um, that, you, that you can say that about. Um, the reason is that the uh, absorbance in a colorimetric assay like this is proportional to the depth of liquid in your, in your plate. So in a 96 well plate, let's say the depth of the, the assay solution is uh, 0.7 of a centimeter. I don't know what it is exactly. Um, when you miniaturize, you're using far less of the reagents, but in a 384 well plate, it's still exactly the same uh, height, the plate, so you can still have 0.7 centimeter depth of, of liquid. So the sensitivity is exactly the same, 96, 384, or even if you miniaturize further. So it's, it's, it's uh, one of the benefits of this assay system. And the last question is, have you got any tips and hints about phosphatase in transmembrane fractions? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, things to think about with this are, um, are there any other phosphatases in the membrane fraction? Because obviously a, a membrane is quite a, a complex mixture. Um, if you have a specific substrate, then it's not particularly, uh, there, there are no particular issues. Um, membrane fractions in the assay could um, uh, cause a certain amount of turbidity. So uh, we think there's a limit as to the amount of membrane you could introduce into the test. Um, possibly solubilizing with detergents is one angle there, if that's a problem. So um, I hope those... Uh, uh, those ideas uh, help out there. Do we have time for any more? 
Um, well, I'm afraid that we've now come to the end of our question and answer session and the end of our webinar. However, like I said before, uh, we have all the questions that you've sent in and we will respond to all the remaining questions by email as soon as possible. And we hope that you've enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you for joining us and hopefully